In this video, we'll be going over the multiple choice section of the 2019 HSC math paper. I've divided this video into sections so you can just scroll across the timeline there and you can go to the specific question that you're after. Just want to run across a few things before we get started. In the exam, you would be provided with five minutes of reading time and this section is worth 10 marks. Now, these are the easiest 10 marks you can get in the exam, so be sure not to overthink it. You need to allow yourself anywhere between one to one and a half minutes per question. As they do say, give yourself about 15 minutes to do this entire section. If you find yourself taking too long, uh, on a particular question, leave it and come back to it in the end. It's also really important to familiarize yourself with the reference sheet before the exam. I'll have a link in the description below for anyone who wants access to that. Okay, let's get started. Question one, this is a really easy question. It's asking you to find what is the value of pi to the power of 10, correct to two significant figures. All you need to do here is simply plug that into your calculator. So you have pi to the power of 10, you get a value. Now what you need to do is, depending on your calculator, is get it into Psi mode and then select how many significant figures you want it to. And you'd get 9.4 times 10 to the power of 4, leaving you with the answer B. Question 2. What values of x satisfy 4 minus 3x is less than or equal to 12? Now this is a simple algebraic question and the aim is to get x on its own on one side. So the first thing I'm going to do is to subtract both sides by 4, leaving me with minus 3x is less than or equal to 8. Again, to get x on its own, I'm going to divide both sides by negative 3. Now, what we're going to have to remember here is, when I am dividing by a negative, the inequality flips. And so that leaves me with x is greater than or equal to negative 8 thirds. That is answer D. Question 3. What is the value of p so that what I've got here on the left-hand side is equal to a to the power of p? Now, this is actually a very simple question. I'm going to be applying the basic index laws, particularly because all my bases are the same on the left-hand side. So just as a reminder, if my bases are the same and I'm multiplying by one another, my powers are going to add. And if my bases are the same and I am dividing, my powers will subtract. So the first thing I'm going to do is, is I'm going to convert this square root of a and I'm going to change it into index form. And that leaves me with a to the power of half. Next step is I'm going to join my powers here in the numerator. Now remember a squared is being multiplied by a to the power of negative 3 so there is actually a multiplication sign in between here so what do my powers need to do now? They need to add remembering that 2 plus negative 3 is in fact 2 minus 3. So that leaves me with a to the power of 2 minus 3 over a to the power of a half. Now remember the fraction bar represents division. So now I have a to the power of 2 minus 3 take away half, leaving me with a to the power of negative 3 on 2. Now remember, we wanted to get it into the form of a to the p and I now have it in that form. So by default here, now I've got p is equal to negative 3 on 2 and that leaves me with the answer b. Question 4. A parabola has vertex 2, 1 and focus at 5, 1. What is the equation of this parabola? Now the best way to go about this is to actually mark them on the graph just to get an idea on what the parabola is going to look like. So, marking all those important points here, I've got here my vertex is at 2, 1, and my focus here at 5, 1. You can tell that my parabola is going to be concave to the side. And the reason being is, is remember, your focus and your vertex are always in line with one another. That means it must satisfy y minus k all squared equals 4ax minus h. Now, remembering, I was told that the vertex was at 2, 1, how did I get a is equal to 3? Now remember, a is your focal distance. So that's the distance between your vertex and your focus. And as you can tell here, my distance is 3 units. Okay, and so now I've got a is equal to 3. Now, and remembering that h represents your x-coordinate of your vertex and k represents your y-coordinate of your vertex. Popping that in, I get y minus 1 squared is equal to 12 bracket x minus 2, leaving me with the answer C. Question 5. Which of the following is equal to log base of 2, 9 divided by log base of 2, 3? Now what I can tell here is if I change 9 into index form, it may actually help me as then I can have both of them as bases of 3. So the first step is, is now I've got my logs are both to the base of 2, so now I've got log 3 squared divided by log 3. Now remember, what happens to my power here when it's in the log? It simply comes to the front. So now I've got 
2 log 3 divided by log 3. And as you can see now, I can just simplify my numerator and my denominator there, and I'm left with 2, and the answer there is A. Question 6. A game is played by tossing an ordinary six-sided die and an ordinary coin at the same time. The game is one if the uppermost face of the die shows an even number, or the uppermost face of the co coin shows a tail or both. What is the probability of winning this game? So the probability of winning is simply going to be 1 minus the probability of losing. And so what I've got here now is the probability of losing is going to be the probability of my odd numbers times it by the probability of heads. And this leaves me with 1 minus, well what's the probability of getting an odd number? Well there's 3 out of 6, that's a half, times it by what's the probability of getting heads? That's also a half. And so that gives me three quarters. So your answer is C. Question seven. The diagram shows part of the graph of y equals a sine bx plus four. What are the values of a and b? Well it can be seen that the range of the curve is three units. Have a look here. It's gone from the lowest point minus two and a half to the highest point of five and a half. So I can tell here my range is three units which means that the curve has been stretched one and a half times vertically, so my amplitude is one and a half. So that automatically eliminates A and B. Now the curve also has a period of pi. So a period occurs when it's completed one cycle. So as you can tell here, it's at this point up to here. And so that go, so it completes one whole period at pi. So this means that the curve has been squished two times horizontally, so my b is 2. So the answer is d. Question 8. A particle is moving along a straight line. The graph shows the acceleration of the particle. For what value of t is the velocity v a maximum? Okay, so a couple of things to note here is, is first of all, I've got an acceleration versus time graph. So I need to remember, acceleration is the derivative of velocity. And so from that, I know that my maximum or minimum velocity is going to occur when a is equal to zero. Remember, because when I differentiate my velocity, in order to get a maximum or minimum of that, I need to set it to zero. And so from that, I can tell here is when my acceleration is zero. And so therefore, my maximum velocity is going to be at t is equal to 3. So the answer is c. Question 9. Which expression is equal to the integral of tan squared x dx? This is a really easy question and it requires you to remember these identities. That tan squared x is equal to sec squared x minus 1. From that, I'm now going to integrate sec squared x minus 1. Now remember, you're given a reference sheet, and on that reference sheet, it actually tells you what the integral of sec squared x is, and it's tan x, and the integral of 1 is simply x. And now don't forget to add your c, so your answer is tan x minus x plus c, so the answer there is a. Question 10. A particle is moving along a straight line with displacement x at time t. The particle is stationary when t is equal to 11 and when t is equal to 13. Which of the following must be true in this case? Now, although this question is much easier to now, although this question is easy to do if we were just going to cancel out all the false options, let's just consider why c is actually true. So let's consider the velocity function. We know that it equals zero at t is equal to eleven and at t is equal to thirteen. We are trying to show that the velocity function must have a stationary point between t is 11 and t is 13. So let's assume that it doesn't have a stationary point. Therefore, the velocity function must be either increasing or always decreasing between t is equal to 11 and t is equal to 13 as it can never switch. However, if this is the case, the velocity function can never come back to zero. Therefore, this is impossible and it must have a stationary point. Thanks for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe. Let me know what you thought of the video and what you'd like to see next in the comments.